Tonight's presentation is titled Machine Learning, and our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is continuing in his monthly series of EAA webinars for which we're most grateful and so thankful for him sharing his thoughts and expertise and information as he does every month. Mike's president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, A&P mechanic certificate, inspection authorization privileges, 2008, the FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. <clears throat> okay, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Let me see if I can grab this. Um, so uh, tonight we're going to be doing... Um, uh, webinar on the subject of machine learning it's a it's a little bit different than what what i usually do um but this is um actually a follow-up on a webinar that i did um a little over a year ago in july 2020 on predictive maintenance um and i kind of want to bring you up to date on on where we are now because we've made quite a bit of uh of interesting progress um in in this area um in in the webinar that i did um, in july of last year i talked uh, about the uh revolution in um in maintenance in in uh, in the airline industry um <clears throat> that was uh being caused by uh are predictive analytics. Predictive analytics basically uh, takes sensor data um, from various systems in the aircraft, and uh, our modern airliners are absolutely riddled with sensors. Um, the data is uh, is is collected um, and either uh, tel telemet sent, sent to the ground via telemetry in real time, or else uh, correct uh, collected in a quick access recorder, which is uh, pulled from the aircraft uh, when it lands. Um, but nowadays, more and more of it is being uh, sent via telemetry in real time. Um, Boeing is sort of the leader in this area, but, uh, but a, a lot of the uh, other uh, companies in the airline industry um, uh, Airbus, uh, the engine manufacturers, and so on um, are, are are doing this stuff, and the result has been uh, pretty amazing. The, and the whole idea of predictive maintenance is is um, uh, is to use this data to try to um, predict when uh, uh, failures are about to occur, or when some sort of um, uh, maintenance operation is uh, is is being called for. Um, now, the airline industry has been doing this now for about a decade, and they've gotten very good at it. We're just sort of starting to do this uh, in uh, owner flow and general aviation. Um, and my company, Savvy, uh, does a, a lot of engine monitor data analysis. We we started our savvy analysis platform in 2013, and uh, are the primary supplier of of uh, analysis for uh, of, of engine monitor data for piston powered general aviation aircraft. Um, we've been doing this uh, since 2013, so I guess it's been about eight years. And in the course of that time, we have collected in our database um, flights from about three and a half million general aviation flights. Um, something like 35,000 data samples uh, in an average flight. So, uh, so somewhere on the order of magnitude of 10 billion data samples in our database. It's a lot of data and it's enough to do some pretty interesting things. Um, some of the things that we've done with this data is to start is to issue report cards uh, to the users of our platform where we uh, periodically will send them a report that 
shows how their aircraft stacks up in a whole bunch of different uh, dimensions compared to all of the other aircraft of the same make and model uh, that we follow, or what we call the, the, the cohort. Um, we're also providing them trend analysis reports where we look backward over time at various um, parameters and try to determine mathematically whether there are any statistically significant trends. And if so, we show what those trends are. Here's a, a case of a trend report that's showing um, maximum CHT in crews to have a statistically significant upward trend, but it's still in uh, down around the 20th percentile of all of the other aircraft of that type we follow. So I'm not sure it's anything to get worried about yet, um, but that's what a trend analysis report looks like. So in 2014, we took our first very primitive step um, towards uh, predictive analytics. That is trying to use engine mounted data to predict uh, failures, uh, incipient failures before they happen. Um, we were focusing on exhaust valve failures because uh, failing exhaust valves, first of all, are the number one reason that people have to get cylinders removed from piston engines. And second of all, it's a significant cause of, of uh, in-flight engine problems. Um, so we, we launched this program called FEVA, uh, which is an acronym for failing exhaust valve analytics. Um, now, when a, an exhaust valve fails in flight, the result is usually a partial power loss of engine power. Um, how much power is lost uh, depends, in, for one thing, on whether you're flying a four or a six cylinder engine, because if you lose one cylinder um, in a six cylinder engine, you're still going to wind up having about 80% power available, although the engine will probably be running pretty rough. In a four-cylinder engine, you'll have significantly less than that, and the engine will be running super rough. Um, if it's a turbocharged engine, um, failure of an exhaust valve can sometimes take out the turbocharger because the piece of the exhaust valve that 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 uh, that fails will go out the exhaust, and it, it, it may go through the turbocharger. And if it takes out the turbocharger, it will cause the engine to go normally aspirated, which will be another uh, increased uh, loss of power. And once in a great while, um, an exhaust valve failure can actually cause, take out the whole engine, could cause a catastrophic engine failure. It's, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen on occasion. Uh, I actually was involved as an expert witness in, in two air crash cases, uh, fatal aircraft cake, air crash cases that were caused by uh, by exhaust valve failure. Here's kind of this wor the worst case scenario where the entire head of the valve uh, detaches from the stem and um, then bounces around inside the cylinder. And if it gets in the wrong position, it, it can shatter the piston and, and, uh, and, and cause a catastrophic uh, failure of the entire engine. Doesn't happen very often, but as I said, over, over the, the last, 12 years or so, um, I've been involved in, in, in two fatal accidents that were caused by this. So it's something we have to take pretty seriously. Um, the good news is that valve failure usually occurs pretty gradually. Um, from the first, uh, from the point where it, the valve failure first becomes detectable um, under the bore scope, it typically takes 50 or 100 hours uh, until the valve actually fails outright. So if we're looking at it reasonably frequently with a bore scope, um, we're very likely to, uh, to, to catch the problem be, before it, it, it uh, can cause any safety issue. And the study of our data uh, of the data in our database indicates that uh, exhaust valve failure is, is a relatively rare phenomenon, and, and that at any given point in time, somewhere between two and three percent of exhaust valves are in the process of failing. Um, the best tool we have for detecting 
uh, exhaust valve failure uh, before it happens is is borescopes. Um, and uh, uh, there's there's been a fair amount of material published now on on what you look for with the borescope and how you can tell if the exhaust valve is starting to fail or not. The basic rule is that the, the exhaust valve the the pattern of Exhaust deposits on the face of the valve should be symmetrical, should look like a bullseye. And when the pattern starts to get asymmetrical, that's an indication that the, that the valve is, uh, is in the process of failing. And the more asymmetrical it gets, the closer to outright failure the, the exhaust valve is. So in a perfect world, we would love to see uh, every cylinder on every piston aircraft engine bore scoped at least every 100 hours. Um, but in the real world, that seldom happens. Um, there, there's still a lot of aircraft mechanics that don't even own a bore scope. In fact, we've been encouraging um, aircraft owners to buy to buy their own. Um, then there are an awful lot of mechanics who do own a bore scope but don't use it regularly. They they only use it if they if they have some other reason to believe that the cylinder has a problem. For example, it. it comes out with a, a bad compression reading during a compression test, but they don't use the bore scope um, as a, as a as a screening tool to to look at every cylinder, which is certainly when we um, manage uh, annual inspections for our clients, we always ask the shop uh, to to do bore scope of every cylinder and to take photographs so that we can see what they're seeing through the bore scope. Um, bore scope inspection doesn't have to be done by an A&P. It can be done by an aircraft owner. There's nothing about it that doesn't fall within the preventive maintenance authority that aircraft owners have. All you need to do is is remove the top spark plug and, and stick the bore scope in and take a bunch of pictures and take it out and put the put the spark plug back in. So that's something that 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 an aircraft owner can do, but not all that many aircraft owners. Are comfortable doing it themselves. Um, and a lot of aircraft owners are reliant on their A and P's, and a lot of A and P's aren't big users of bore scopes. Um, it's important to know that that early detection of a valve problem often means that the problem can be resolved without removing the cylinder. We've had extremely good success um, lapping valves in place. Uh, with the cylinder still installed, um, which saves an awful lot of money and eliminates all of the risks involved in cylinder removal and reinstallation. But you have to catch the problem relatively early. If you wait until the, the, the valve has started to warp or there's a significant amount of metal erosion from the, from the sealing surface of the valve, at that point, it's really too late and you have no choice but to remove the cylinder and, and replace the valve. Um, so if we catch these things early, we can save an awful lot of cylinder removals. So you know, Chris and I uh, were thinking, you know, maybe we can use engine monitor data analysis to alert us when bore scoping ought to be done soon as opposed to waiting for the next annual inspection. Because typically most cylinders at most get bore scoped once a year and frequently they don't get bore scope that often. So in 2014, we launched our first attempt at predicting exhaust valve failure using engine monitor data analysis. And that attempt was based on something that, that we had observed for quite a long time, which is that sometimes exhaust valves that are starting to fail produce a slow rhythmic cyclical EGT oscillation. Here, here's an example um, of a EGT traces for a, uh, an engine um, where one of those traces is a four-cylinder engine, and one of the traces is has has got this funny oscillation on it, and the oscillation correlated with the fact that this that the exhaust valve was failing. You can see how asymmetrical that valve appeared. It doesn't look anything like a bullseye. It's got a big, big hot spot uh, down in the uh, uh, about 7 38 o'clock position um, and if that valve was allowed to remain in service a whole lot longer it, it that 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 
part of the valve that's down in the seven or eight o'clock position would probably break off and, and shut down the cylinder. And um, so it seemed like this pattern ought to be one that would be pretty easy to write a computer program to look for. Uh, our human analysts were trained to look for it, but it, it seemed like if we could, we could create an algorithm to look for it, um, then we could screen every single flight that was uploaded to our system. Uh, and we're talking about millions of flights now um, and, and, and try to catch the ones that, that, that had this pattern. So we created this algorithm um, to detect the pattern. Uh, and this, this approach is called the expert, an expert system approach, because what it does is it tries to, to create a, a computer algorithm that mimics what a human analyst would do. Our human analysts were trained to look for this funny uh, EGT oscillation. And so we wrote a program so that the computer would, would do this, try to do the same thing that our human analysts were looking for. Now it was only looking at one thing, it was looking at EGT and it was only looking for one aspect of EGT and that is a slow rhythmic oscillation. Um, it did catch some, some valves that were failing, but it did not turn out to be as accurate or sensitive as we hope by a long shot. So we thought, well, maybe we can do better. Um, the fundamental limitation of an expert system, like the one that we developed for FIVA, is that it, in the limit, can only be as good as the human expert that it mimics. Um, now, engine monitors generate a huge amount of data from a whole lot of sensors, um, but humans aren't good at recognizing complex interrelationships in, in, in big data. We, we can look at EGT and see if there's an oscillation, but, but we can't easily, humans can't easily look at, at, at 10 or 15 or 20 different um, sensor outputs and, and, and try to figure out what combinations of, of, of signals uh, represent some sort of failure mode. Um, but computers are, are a lot better at that. And so we thought maybe we could do a better job of predicting exhaust valve failure um, if we look at more parameters than just EGT, uh, because the engine monitors uh, instrument a lot of stuff. Um, and we thought that a computer ought to be able to recognize uh, this, th th these failure patterns better than, than a human analyst. Uh, so it seemed like a good candidate for machine learning. And to explain how machine learning works, let me just diverge from aircraft for just a moment. Supposing you wanted to get a computer to recognize, um, to be able to look at photographs of, of human faces and, and distinguish which ones were males and which ones were females. Now, you know, you and I can look at these photos and it's pretty easy for us to figure out which ones are the males and females. But, but how would we teach a computer to do that? Well, there are basically two strategies. Uh, the first strategy, which is what we call expert systems, is we, we get a, a bunch of people together and ask them to try to write down how they figure out whether a face is male or female. And so, you know, one of the experts might say, well, you know, if I see facial hair, I figure it's a male. If, if, if I see a, an elaborate long hairdo, it's probably a female. And, and you get a bunch of people together and, and, and write down all the things they can think of that they use to distinguish between male faces and female faces. And then you try to write a computer program that 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 encodes all of those rules that the that these human experts have articulated, and then test it out and see how well it does. So so that's the expert systems approach. The the other approach, which is the machine learning approach, is quite different. With the machine learning approach, you basically show ten thousand different pictures to a computer. 
and you tell the computer which ones are male and female, and you let the computer try to figure out a, a set of rules for discriminating between males and females. And it turns out that the machine learning approach works a whole lot better than the expert uh, the expert system approach in, in doing this. Um, so in an expert system approach, you, 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 you create an algorithm that you feed into the computer, then you feed data into the computer and it tells you, you know, it, whatever it is you're looking for, whether the faces are male or female in the case I was talking about. In the machine learning approach, you feed data into the computer and you and you tell the computer which ones are male and female and it comes up with the algorithm. Then of course, in, in both cases, you test um, to see how well you did. And um, hopefully after a few tries, you get it to where it's good enough to be useful. So anyway, we, we created a second generation FIBA that we called FIBA2 using a machine learning approach um, instead of using an expert approach. And the, the FIBA used a whole lot more variables uh, than just EGT. Uh, pretty much everything we could think of that might possibly be relevant, we fed into the in, into the machine learning model, more than 30 predictor variables. Some of them were raw data, some of them were derivatives of data, things like standard deviation and mean and uh, uh, Fourier analysis of waveforms and stuff like that. And we fed the computer hundreds of training cases um, that where we knew whether the, a valve, the valves were failing or not, because the, these were cases where, where, where there actually had been borescope inspections done. So we fed all these training cases into the computer, telling them which ones were had failing valves and which ones didn't. And the computer came up with its own algorithm for trying to distinguish which ones were failing or not. And what that algorithm put out was a what we call a valve risk score that 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 indicated how likely it was that a particular valve uh, was was going to be uh, failing. And the higher the risk score, the the higher the likelihood that the valve is failing. Um, uh, Chris did the work on this and and tried a, a variety of machine learning models. Um, the, the the model that you hear the most about, um, especially if you drive a Tesla like I do, is neural networks. But uh, to train a neural network, you really you have to have a very 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 large um, uh, number of of training cases. And in our case, we we didn't have that much data that we could used to train the model with. So Chris tried a number of different um, uh, machine learning models and, and uh, determined that a model called random forests perform best. And if you want to know what that is, you're going to have to ask Chris during the Q&A session because I do not have a clue. Uh, I know it has something to do with decision trees uh, on steroids, but that's about all I know. At any rate, um, came up with 35 different parameters that, that were fed into the model that, that were derived from the raw data that came from the engine monitor. Uh, as I said, in some cases, we calculated means and standard deviations. We analyzed what phase of flight it was so that we could look for, for, for uh, things only during the cruise phase, for example. Uh, we performed some Fourier analysis on uh, various parameters, including EGT, to determine the, things like oscillation and frequency of, of, of oscillation and so on. And we went through our maintenance ticket system uh, that, that, that documents all of the maintenance, all of the, the maintenance that we have um, managed over the last 13 years and came up with 3,400 cases where exhaust valve condition was known 
and where we had recent engine monitor data uh, the, the, just prior to, to the bore scope inspection. Um, and we went through and identified each of these 3,400 cases as either failing or normal. Uh, we split the 3,400 cases in, into two groups, one that we used for training and then one that we used for, for testing the model to see how well it did. Um, and for each of these known cases, we, we captured engine monitor data from um, recent flights, up to 10 recent flights prior to the borescope inspection uh, that was used to determine valve condition, whether there was whether the valves were in good shape or whether they were failing. And then we used the test set to determine how well the model uh, did. Um, now, there were really two things. That, there are a number of different ways that you measure model performance, but the two key things are what are called sensitivity and positive predictive value. Uh, the sensitivity of the model says what percentage of failing valves are correctly identified. In other words, um, how many failures does it catch versus how many failures does it miss? And positive predictive value is, is what percentage of the valves that the model predicts to be failing are actual fail, act, actually failing. So it's a measure of how good it is at avoiding false positives. So let's talk a little bit about how the, the FIVA 2 performed on the test set um, and how its predictions compared to what was actually determined via the, the Bohr scope, which is the gold standard. And I'll start by telling you that that in in both sensitivity and positive predictive value, the the machine learning uh, approach did considerably better than than the original expert approach. So it was definitely a step in the right direction. But how far a step in the right direction was it? Well, here's what we basically came up with when we when we tested the model. We determined that it correctly catches 50% of actual valve failures. Um, and that three out of four of the valves that it predicted to be failing were not actually failing. Now that doesn't sound terribly encouraging, but let me state it in a different way. About one in 30 valves were actually in failure as determined by the bore scope. And a valve predicted by the machine learning model to have an above average probability of failure um, had a one in four chance of actually being in failure. And a valve predicted by the model to have a below average probability of failure had a one in a hundred chance of being in failure. So the model actually gives you quite a lot of information about the, the likelihood of failure. And the question is, 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 is it good enough to be useful? So we have to think a little bit about, you know, what, uh, how useful a, a prediction of, of that uh, sensitivity and that positive predictive value is. If we were to use it as a diagnostic test, it would be an abysmal failure because three out of the four predictions of failing valve were false positive. So we certainly would not ever suggest that because the model predicts that a, that a valve is at high risk of failure, the, the cylinder ought to be pulled or something like that. Um, but as a screening test, the model is, is extremely useful because what it's doing is it's calling for a bore scope inspection, uh, an early bore scope inspection, in other words, not waiting till the, the next annual, on valves that have a one in four chance of failing. So that seems like something that that that's, would be very, very useful in, in, in finding failing valves before they fail and finding them early so that maybe they, the, the problem can be rectified without cylinder removal. Now, this is a very difficult message to communicate. 
And I want to just tell you a little bit about our experience in, in, in when we started sending these FIBA 2 reports to our clients, because we, it, was, it was very, very interesting. Um, and it got, this part is more, more has to do with, with human psychology than it does with anything technical. But since we started sending out these FIFA 2 reports to our clients, we've got a lot of complaints about false positives. Um, where, where the, the owner um, got a report that said a cylinder was it uh, was was at elevated concern he had his mechanic bore scope and the bore scope looked normal now we we know that that's going to happen a lot because there's there's a 3 out of 4 chance that the bore scope is going to show the valve as being normal and this upset a lot of users and they said you know why did you score me at risk for no good reason We've gotten no complaints about false negatives, about about failing valves that we didn't catch, which to me seems like a much bigger problem. But 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 our, our clients seem to see it differently. Apparently they prefer getting good news that isn't true to getting bad news that isn't true, which is kind of interesting. Um, we we realized that we had to do a better job of getting across this distinction between screening and diagnosing. That, that FIVA is not a diagnostic test. It, because there is a high FIVA score, that doesn't mean we're condemning your valve. It, it's, it, what FIVA is, it's, it's a screening test. It's giving you guidance whether or not it's worth taking a look with a boroscope. And, and if if you understand that that's what its objective is, then it's a very it's it's very useful information, because it has a pretty good chance of of alerting you to an incipient problem earlier than you than you would know about it otherwise, and maybe early enough to resolve the problem without pulling a cylinder. And when we started sending out these reports, we were sending out reports that looked something like this. For each cylinder, there would be a, a, a bar, and the, the higher the, the risk score that the model produced, the, the higher the bar. We would also color code them so that um, cylinders that were um, at below average risk score would be green, and those with average would be blue, and above average would be red. And if, if a cylinder was at above average risk score, it's about four times as likely to fail as if it was an average risk score. If it was below average, it would be about half as likely to fail as if it was an average risk score. These reports didn't go over very well. They freaked out a lot of people. Um, there, there were just a lot of triggers here. The, 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 a red bar that says you're at above average risk of failing um, would just send our clients into a tizzy. And uh, we realized that we, we needed to change our messaging a little bit. So our next iteration of this report looked something like this, where we, we tried to, we talked about valve condition, uh, we, we, no matter how high the score was, the bar never got red. We, we, we made the bars, you know, kind of a, uh, kind of a spectral wash instead of being a bright red bar. Uh, we, we put predicted failure probability off onto the left so that they knew that even a really high bar, the, the, the predicted probability of failure was, you know, only eight or 10%. Um, that that didn't get the job done either. There, there were still a, enough trigger words and so on on these reports that 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 people would sort of panic when they got them. Um, let's see, another problem that we had, which Chris called the flat top problem, was that 
some of the clients would look at these reports and they would get really upset if all the bars weren't the same height, you, you, even though the highest bar what was what was in in the average uh, failure rate category that they somehow interpreted the highest bar as as being in trouble e even if it if it didn't get into the area of elevated concern so recently we decided that we were going to make another change to how we reported this stuff and get rid of the bars altogether and so our, our our reports that we recently started sending out look like this. There are no bars. The, the cylinders are are, are, are color-coded with a level of concern. And um, the message is very clear that we recommend bore scoping certain cylinders because they are a, the the model predicts them to have elevated concern and it states right on the report that elevated concern means that there's a one in four chance that the valve is failing uh, based on our what, uh, on our test data um, whether or not this is going to solve the messaging problem or not uh, it's not clear we probably will continue to iterate this until we until we think we have it right but what's very important is is that that people who get these reports understand what these air these the, these three different categories mean um, average concern means there's roughly a one in 30 probability of a failing valve, which is pretty much what we see see kind of across the board. Um, elevated concern means that there's a one in four probability of a failing valve, which we think is a high enough probability that it is really worth um, the very simple and, and, and inexpensive um, effort to uh, uh, to take out the top spark plug, stick a bore scope in, and take a look at the valve. Because the the the, the cost of a false positive is is very modest. Um, if if it's done at the next oil change where the top cowling is off anyway, um, bore scoping a cylinder is, you know, fifteen to thirty minutes tops. It's it's just not a not not a very big effort. But if our messaging is wrong, the emotional cost can be very high. The client has to understand what the score means and what it doesn't mean and, and not panic. And, and I'll end this section just with a, with a little anecdote, just because I think it's kind of funny. Um, when we sent out uh, fever reports, uh, we, we got a, an email back from a, from a client named Jim um, who said, this is mean, not cool. Well, we weren't quite sure what that meant. <laughs> so uh, we reviewed his FIBA report and it turned out it was actually quite a good report. No, no, none of his valves were at above average risk. And so Chris called Jim to ask him to clarify what, what did, did he mean by this report being mean and not cool? And Jim's response was, you sent me a report, so something must be wrong. So for Jim, any report was bad news. So sometimes you can't win. At any rate, just briefly, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the other things that we're working on in this area um, that hopefully maybe um, in six months or a year, I'll be able to do another webinar and bring you up to date on. Um, one of the, the things that we uh, would, um, would really like to add to our arsenal is, um, is predictive analytics that, that, that detect um, uh, sticking exhaust valves, which is um, a big, big problem with Lycoming engines. Um, sticking exhaust valve means that the valve doesn't slide freely in the guide, typically because um, deposits have built up on the valve stem that makes it hard for the valve to move in the guide. Uh, typically, the, the earliest symptoms of this are something that we call morning sickness, where when you first start the engine cold, it runs kind of rough because not all the cylinders are lighting off, but 
once the engine warms up a little bit, everything seems to be normal and you go flying and everything's fine. And a, a lot of owners just accept the the morning sickness and don't think very much about it, but it's a very important warning sign um, that there's a valve sticking problem developing. And if you don't do something about it, eventually it, you wind up with a, a, a valve that sticks in flight and that can have bad consequences. It can result in a bent push rod. Um, if the valve sticks open, it, there could be a valve strike where the piston actually comes up and strikes the the, the head of the valve because the valve couldn't couldn't close in time. Um, it, again, you 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 lose a cylinder, you get a power loss. Uh, if there's a valve strike, it can knock the head off the valve and lead to a catastrophic engine failure. So it's it's pretty serious. And you know, one approach is to is simply train pilots to to be cognizant of of these morning sickness symptoms and and take action. But we've been talking about that for years and years and years, and and still an awful lot of people just just ignore it. So we we would love to have um, a, uh, a predictive analytics thing that 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 can detect this symptom by looking at engine monitor data, um, and, and alert the owners uh, that that there's a potential problem there. Um, and again, it would be a screening tool. And the, the action item would be at minimum to 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 watch the valve with a bore scope and as you open and close the valve, see if it's sticking, or possibly do the lycoming wobble test, um, which is a, a more precise way of determining whether the valve is sticking or not. Um, and we're starting on this much the way we started on FEVA originally, which is that our first attempt at it is going to be um, more of an expert system than machine learning, but that eventually we're we're, we're, we're going to probably try to uh, develop a machine learning model that 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 looks for uh, sticking valves. The, the problem with machine learning is that you have to have a fairly large number of of, of known cases. And we're trying to collect as many of these sticking valve problems as we can, but um, we, we presently don't feel that we have enough of them in our inventory of data to, to adequately train a machine learning model. So while we're collecting these, these, these cases, um, we're working on developing a, a, an expert system that, that simply looks for things that look like morning sickness. Um, and, and coming up with just a heuristic algorithm for for, for uh, trying to alert people to sticking valves. And eventually, um, I expect that this will progress into a machine learning model, much in the same way that that we did with FIBA. Another thing that we're working on that we're in very very preliminary stages on, but I find it to be a, a very promising concept, is is uh, is something called clustering analysis. Um, and in clustering analysis, what we do is, is we take a very large number of flights, which we have, we have three and a half million flights, and we divide those, uh, the data for those flights in, into the various phases of flights, um, start up, shut down, run up, climb, cruise, descent, so on. And then we develop, um, uh, cluster maps of, of what various um, instrumented parameters look like in that phase of flight. What, what does manifold pressure look like? What does RPM look like? What does fuel flow look like? And so on. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get these sort of the, these cluster maps. And then we will screen flights to see whether whether we are starting to see data points that fall outside of these clusters, indicating that something seems abnormal. Um, and if, if, if we see data that falls outside of the cluster, um, then we will have a, a, one of our human analysts take a look at it and see what they can make of it and possibly wind up alerting the, uh, the aircraft owner to it. As I say, we're just, starting to, to work on this. It's it's going to be a while before we can determine 
um, how useful it is, but it seems like a uh, like a, a very promising uh, approach uh, to me, and and I'm excited about about doing the the research uh, to uh, to see if we can do something really useful with it. Some of the other things that that we sort of have on our on our wish list for for the future, uh, besides um, exhaust valves and and, uh, and failing exhaust valves and sticking valves, are detection of abnormal combustion events like detonation and pre-ignition. Um, again, if, so that if we can detect those, that we can alert the aircraft owner to get the cylinder bore scoped and see if there's any any damage uh, in the combustion chamber that, that requires uh, being dealt with. Uh, detection of, of problems with the with the valve train, uh, worn cam lobes, collapsed lifters, that sort of thing that, that causes valves not to be operating the way they should. Um, and this is just the beginning, I think. The more sensors that we have in our airplanes and more and more stuff's getting instrumented all the time, and, um, the, the, the sky's the limit as to what you can do with this approach. It's really up to our imagination to, uh, to, to figure out things that we can do with this. Um, so this predictive analytics uh, based on machine learning, I think is clearly the wave of the future. I think it's gonna be playing a more and more important role in maintenance um, as we go into the future. And over time, increasingly, it will be the aircraft itself rather than mechanics that tell us what maintenance needs to be done. And with that, um, Tim, uh, let me open it up for Q&A and, um, Hopefully Chris is on. Chris did most of the R&D in this area. So any questions that get into any depth, I'm going to defer to Chris on. All right, well, thanks, Mike. Uh, fascinating and uh, just tremendous work that you've done in this area. Uh, obviously groundbreaking for general aviation. How cool is this? Um, let's start with Bruce's question here. Does your analysis use the history of the particular engine you're looking at, i.e. how long do you need data from a particular engine to get useful results? Chris, you there? <laughs> yeah, as I say, you want me to try, try to answer that one? Absolutely. Um, sure, well, uh, good question, excellent question. Um, we, uh, in, in FIVA 2, the machine learning uh, version of FIVA, um, we've kind of had two iterations of it. FIVA 2.1 looked at uh, the three most recent flights. Um, I'm sorry, FIVA 2.0, our, our first uh, version. Uh, the most recent version that we released about, gosh, two months ago, uh, we call FIVA 2.1. And it includes up to 10 flights of 10 of your most recent flights. Uh, and there are certain conditions for those flights to qualify. We have to be able to, to identify a cruise segment in the flight, for instance. Um, but, but we feel that that's a pretty good indication of uh, you know, the, the current situation with the engine. We don't wanna go too far back because you know, we'll start to um, we st we start to to kind of lose the most current behavior of the engine. So we figured 10, 10 flights seemed to be about right. And Chris is wondering, how often do you update your machine learning models with new data sets? Another very good question. Uh, we, we try to do it uh, uh, on a, a monthly basis. Um, it, uh, it it is uh, something that we we don't always meet that just because of uh, time constraints. But we we aim for about once a month uh, to fold in all the new flights uh, and example cases that we have into the data set. And uh, Sarah wonders. As you gain more data, are you seeing improvements to the predictability rate of the model? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah, that 
that is the case uh, when we started the, the FIVA 2 machine learning algorithm. Uh, we, we, as Mike said, it was uh, quite a significant improvement over the uh, expert version of FIVA. Uh, FIVA 2.1, which is the most recent version of FIVA, had about a 20% improvement in both sensitivity and positive predicted value. And I think that might have to do with the fact that our data set was larger for FIVA 2.1. Also that we added about, well, about five more uh, features. Features are what machine learning people call, what statisticians call uh, independent variables or parameters. So we added uh, about five more of those. So that I think helped the uh, accuracy of the model. And what about the the increased look back, Chris? Does doesn't that tend to reduce the the false positive rate? Um, well, I hope so. Uh, I I think in theory it does. I I don't think we've really measured that, so I don't I don't claim that make that claim. But but I think you know that was the whole idea was that it would uh, it it would give you a better kind of a better picture of the engine's behavior, kind of its average recent behavior, rather than three three recent flights, and one of those could have been some sort of odd mission that the flight was on that kind of polluted the data. So we feel that the, the 10 flights gives us a, kind of a smoother um, data set. And Benson wonders, does the length of the flights change the way you weigh between the 10 flights you analyze? Uh, no, it does does not. That's, that's an interesting idea, whether we should do that or maybe the length of the cruise segment uh, to kind of weight the data based on that. But at present, we're, we're not doing that. We're just making calculations based on averages during the cruise segment of flight, along with other things like the maximum cylinder head temperatures for the flight, that sort of thing. But many of the features are features derived in the, in the cruise phase. Chris, isn't there, a, isn't there a minimum length of the cruise segment that, that you require in order to include it? Yeah, we have a 10 minute minimum and we, uh, we we won't use a flight unless it's at least 45 minutes long. With a, with a minimum of 10 minutes in, in steady state cruise. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, Larry's wondering about uh, how is the data transferred from the aircraft? Is it a hard line dump or telemetry, something <laughs> else? And Tro Troper wonders, is there a way to auto upload the flight data to the website? Boy, there's right. a great well, question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll answer the first half of that <clears throat> and let Mike answer the second half because this has been kind of the holy grail for for Mike. Um, uh, presently, it it's there's a lot of human involvement. Uh, it, most data from the aircraft is downloaded from the uh, the instrument in the airplane, the engine monitor using something like an SD card or a, a USB key, something of that sort, which is then connected to the computer and uh, uh, and the, our clients go to our site, a uh, website on the computer and actually upload the data from that USB key or SD card into our database. Um, and uh, uh, they can do that for free. You don't have to be a paying customer savvy to, to use our platform to uh, archive your data and to view, view your data, you know, on a chart and that sort of thing. Uh, but that, that's kind of a multi-step process and it's not one that, that uh, every owner, you know, relishes doing. Um, so Mike, you want to talk a little bit about maybe what, be, what might be coming in that area? Yeah, Chris is being very kind. I, I would I would phrase it and just to say, pilots do an absolutely miserable job of of 
of extracting the data from their engine monitors and, and uploading it. And that's been a, a significant limitation um, because predictive analytics really requires um, having a, you know, sort of a steady stream of rel relatively current data. We've had some very sad stories where, where the predictive analytics pr predicted the a valve failure, and it turned out that the, the valve actually failed because the data was not uploaded in a timely fashion where we actually were able to give a warning in time. Um, so uh, we are, I guess I would say, I think we're very, very close to announcing a, a, a new initiative that will provide the ability to do telemetry uh, from the aircraft uh, by installing a, a little box in the aircraft that, that, that connects to the engine monitor, uh, transmits the data via Bluetooth to the, the, the pilot's um, uh, smartphone or, or iPad or something, and, and then it uses the, uh, the cellular connection to transmit the data into the cloud, at, basically at the end of every flight. Um, and uh, this is something that, that, that I've been trying to get put together for a long time, pretty much ever since we, we started the Savvy Analysis Project in 2014. And it looks like we're we're pretty close to 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 having that put together. There's, there are a few little obstacles we have to get past, but I'm I'm hoping that it won't be too long before I can do a webinar and talk about that that very subject. That'll be great. Um, Robert wonders, um, do you have separate analysis for different types of engines, such as he has a Jabiru engine? And uh, a couple other people have asked about Rotax engines, and if you have data separate for, for like a Jabiru or Rotax, or is it just traditional continental like homing? I know we do a lot of a, a lot of Rotax engines, Chris. Uh, I'm not sure about the the Jabiru, but maybe you know. I know Joe would know, but right. Um, I I doubt if we have in our in our test set any Jabirus. Um, and I'm not sure about road taxes. And that's a very good question, though, because they're very different from, uh, obviously, from the uh, Continental and Lycoming so that most of us have in our aircraft. And whether the, the models work uh, differently on those engines is something that we're, we're going to have to try to understand better. Okay, I, I I took the question to mean a little di different than you did. Um, mm. you, you were answering the question with respect to FIVA. I I, uh, I took the question just to, as whether or not we're 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 doing uh, data analysis. Um, of, oh, yeah. For, for, so, and, and we we sorry, are doing yeah, data analysis for a lot of, a lot of different kinds of engines, but uh, but I think Chris is probably correct that that all, all of the data in the in the failing valve test set was probably limited to Lycoming's and Continental. And uh, Philip wonders, does your collected data differentiate between certificated and experimental aircraft? If so, is there any notable trends between the two? Uh, the answer to that is is no. We we don't differentiate between you know, home belts or, or experimentals and, and certificated aircraft, the the engines tend to be pretty much the same in both, except for, you know, again, the road taxes and Jabiru's and that sort of thing. But we pretty much treat everybody as a as, as an equal in, in this space. Yeah, and, and we do have an awful lot of RZ, RVs with Lycomings in our test set. <laughs> we do. Peter wonders, is machine learning prediction always more mm -hmm. accurate than a knowledgeable A&P studying the engine monitor data? <laughs> I, I, I laugh at that because there are probably, the, the number of A&Ps who 
would even have a clue as to what to look for in engine monitor data can probably be counted on the fingers of one hand. Uh, the, 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 a and P's typically don't even look at engine monitor data. Um, we, we actually do have a, a a program that we launched for A and P's who who want to wanted to make use of the Savvy Analysis platform, and it's called Savvy Analysis Pro Packs. Mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you, we didn't have very many takers. The the, the interest in this among A and P mechanics is uh, is it typically very very low. It's it's owners that are interested in this stuff, not not mechanics. I, I wish it wasn't that way. But. Let, let me just add to what, what Mike just said. Um, the, the machine learning model is really dealing with, with a lot of variables at the same time. And as Mike mentioned in his presentation, it's very hard to, to visually see some of the patterns that the machine learning model is, is coming up with. It, it's very difficult for any human being, even even if you're a very experienced analyst, be, because there's just so many things going on at once. And that's that's really the beauty of machine learning is it statistically does that job, uh, kind of under the hood. So so this this isn't to criticize A and P's. Um, it's more to criticize the human being for. The, the limitations of being able to, to, to see a pattern in the data. Yeah, I mean, well, one of the, the, the funny things is that when we were doing, you know, the original expert uh, FIVA 1, um, and if somebody said, well, why did, why did FIVA alert on my, on my number three cylinder? It was very easy to go look at the data and say, well, it alerted. Take a look at the data. You can see that the EGT was oscillating. With FIVA 2, we can't do that anymore. We, we don't have a clue as to why it alerted. It's, it's so complicated that, 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 that we can't possibly know why it, why it did what it did. And that's one of the enigmatic things about machine learning. If you, if, if you train a machine learning algorithm to, to distinguish male and female faces, um, it may do an extremely good job, but it's not going to tell you how it did it. <laughs> and it's it, it's just one of the peculiar aspects of machine learning. That's really freaky. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Uh, Jeff wants to know, is the data being used to feed back to engine companies regarding performance and or driving their improvements? No. Um, it, one of my mild disappointments is that none of the engine manufacturers have really shown any interest. It seems to me that engine manufacturers could benefit tremendously by um, using engine monitor data for their for, for the engine that they have out on the field to to drive, you know, some of their warranty stuff and so on. There was actually one company that that did show a significant interest in it, and that was ECI. And, but unfortunately, ECI uh, went out of business and was uh, acquired out of bankruptcy from by Continental before uh, anything could happen with that. And Continental has has not shown any interest, nor has nor has Lycoming or anybody. But I do think engine manufacturers are are missing uh, an important opportunity um, by by not um, first of all, I think that that aircraft engines should be delivered from the factory with a good sensor package on them. Um, and second of all, I think that that engine manufacturers could benefit tremendously by uh, by looking at the engine monitor data generated by their engines out in the field, but they're not doing that. Dave wonders, does my EDM 700 set at the max sample rate, if I remember correctly, two second intervals, collect enough data for Viva to provide good predictions of valve failure? Well, um, there's two issues with, with different engine monitors. 
and and their relation relationship to to how how good a FIVA prediction uh, you can get. The, the first one is the sample rate, as as he mentioned. Um, a, a two second sample rate is is good enough for the, the measuring the features that we use in in FIVA two. The, where the sample rate is is a problem is is in the uh, measuring the cyclicity <laughs> that's a word cyclicity of the exhaust gas temperatures which we do you recall that FIVA one was was looking for this cyclical pattern uh, FIVA two also looks for that pattern as as in a couple of the features that go into the model uh, its prediction. But FIVA2 does it a little differently. It uses something called a Fourier transform to try to understand what frequencies that EGT is oscillating at and, and how strong those those oscillations are. If the if the sample rate is too slow, like say six seconds, it's tougher for for that particular part of the model to get the data it needs. Now the the other uh, factor is is how many different sensors the the engine has and and uh, because a very bare bones engine monitor which measures for instance just EGT and CHT um, really we can't we can't use it to find the first of all the cruise segment um, and even if we can find the cruise segment with a, a little bit more sophisticated monitor if you're not, if you don't have access to to some of the other measures like fuel flow and such, um, it it's uh, oil temp, oil pressure, that kind of thing. It it does affect the I think the uh, effectiveness of the model. So Chris, is there is there a minimum uh, minimum sensor set that's required to satisfy the FIVA two FIVA two? Well, at, at present, we're uh, we're using as the minimum set. Can does can we find a cruise segment? And um, uh, to find a cruise segment, not to get too far into the weeds, but we have an algorithm that that, that goes through a couple of different steps to try to find a cruise segment. If the engine monitor records altitude, we can pretty much do it easily. If it doesn't record altitude, it gets more difficult, uh, but we do have some some ways, some tricks we use to try to, to find it by looking for stable patterns in 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 EGT and and fuel flow and that kind of thing. So um, so the answer to the question you asked, Mike, is is if we can find crews, we will give a FIVA two report. And you know there there are many pieces of this that we're going to want to analyze going forward. And and one of them I think is going to be the the difference in accuracy uh, the, as a function of how much data the 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 engine monitor captures. It's just something we we haven't had time to look at closely yet. So Martin, uh, ahead, Chris, Mike. would it be would it be a correct statement to say that a an EDM 700 set at a two second rate with the fuel flow uh, option installed would be able to get a FIVA 2 report, but if it didn't have the fuel flow option installed, it would not. Is that correct or not? That, that's, yes, that, that's generally correct. So, so feeding right off of that, Martin's question is, is there a good entry level engine monitor that can be installed in a low cost older 172 or similar GA airplane that can be used to monitor and transfer engine data? Mike, I'll yeah. let you grab this one. <laughs> okay, well, we, we, we get that, that question a lot, and there are several decent candidates uh, for uh, entry-level engine monitors that do a good job. Um, the JPI EDM 730 and 830, the Electronics International CGR 30P, uh, and the uh, Insight um, uh, G2 would all be uh, pretty reasonable choices to to put in a 172. There are, there are some other choices, of course. You can spend as much money on this as you want, but if you're looking at 
at, at, at putting in a, 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 the, a low end engine monitor that, that, that has adequate functionality, um, but without a huge price. Those are the, probably the three that I would take a look at. Maybe a potential presentation for the future, kind of outlaying possibilities and uh, you know their pluses, minuses, uh, cost, benefit analysis type presentation. Yep. Cassandra, that's... yeah. Cassandra is wondering, as other people have asked this question, but for mechanics who are interested in learning more about interpreting engine analytics, can you recommend a resource where they can learn more? Well, um, I we 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 have, as you know, a program that that does uh, engine monitor analysis, human analysis of engine monitors, and our um, our director of that part of our business, director of operations for savvy analysis, Joe Godfrey, actually does a monthly column um, uh, in our newsletter that uh, it really goes through analyzing different situations uh, different different engine monitor situations for aircraft um, and uh, those and I'm blanking out on what Joe calls that the Mike, the you puzzler. Remember what? yeah it's oh, the puzzler. Puzzler. Right. and we have a we well, have we, an archive of them there I'm sure there are hundreds of them now <laughs> um, right and I mean I think that's a very effective I think uh, well, that coupled with Mike's engine book, because Mike's engine book kind of explains the theory, and then Joe's puzzlers kind of apply that theory to different, uh, you know, fact sets uh, that come up that have come up in in our doing the analysis for people. So, so that's how I'd recommend somebody go about doing that. John wonders, do you have any idea why a failing exhaust valve causes the EGT to fluctuate? Yes. <laughs> oh, he probably wants more than that, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's the, that's why you're here, Mike. <laughs> the, 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 the reason is, is because um, exhaust valves in almost all of these engines um, are equipped with something called a rotator cap. Uh, which causes the valve to rotate a fraction of a degree every time it opens and closes. And when the engines are running at a, at a normal uh, flight RPM, you know, 2,500 RPM-ish, uh, that valve typically rotates something on the order of, of one revolution per minute. So if the valve is... Uh, develops a hot spot where it's starting to leak exhaust gas. That hot spot, and and assuming that the valve is rotating properly and the rotator cap hasn't failed, and and we have had a problem with rotator cap failures, but assuming that the rotator cap is working, that that hot spot in the valve where it's it's leaking exhaust gas will rotate around the periphery of the of the of the the, the valve seat about one revolution per minute. And in, in rotating, it's rotating from, from a slightly hotter part of the combustion chamber to a slightly colder part of the combustion chamber. And the result is that what the exhaust gas temperature probe sees, which, which is out, mounted outside the exhaust port, will, will fluctuate rhythmically and, and slightly. Now, and by slightly, I'm, we're, we're talking about a fluctuation of, of of maybe 30 degrees Fahrenheit peak to peak on a on a 1500 degree EGT. So it's a very very small percentage fluctuation, but it is uh, it's 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 quite detectable. And uh, and there aren't very many things in an aircraft engine that rotate at one revolution per minute. So if you see that kind of fluctuation, it pretty much has to be coming from the exhaust valve. Gilbert wonders, does the data I upload from my Cirrus perspective provide enough data for everything you guys do? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> David wonders, I'm not familiar with engine monitors, so my question is, do they store just the current flight or 
can they have data from multiple flights for data transfer all at the same time? They can they store data from multiple flights and depending on what generation of engine monitor you have, um, the amount of memory that they can store the data on can can vary quite a bit. The, the very, very old uh, uh, JPI EDM 700s, for example, um, would only have enough room to store, you know, a dozen or, or two dozen flights, depending on what the sample rate was. And, and if you didn't, if you didn't uh, dump the data from the instrument, um, it would scroll off the uh, out of the buffer. Um, some of the more modern ones, like the, the the Cirrus Perspective, for example, or the Garmin Q1000, or any of those, uh, they store the data on an SD card that you plug in, and the SD card can be as as, as pretty much as big as you want, and those things can store hundreds and hundreds of flights. Uh, we don't particularly recommend that you wait until hundreds of flights have been stored before you extract the data because we would like to see the data in a more timely fashion than that. But um, the, some of the modern engine monitors will have, have, have um, sufficient memory to store a, a large number of flights. And some of the older ones have memory that, that only store a dozen or two. Joshua wonders, is the future of FIVA going to be installed in an engine monitor and give me a check engine light on the panel? Well, that's an interesting question because we've we've talked about that. Um, uh, the, the likelihood is <clears throat> that that is not gonna happen anytime in the near future because in order for it to be installed in, in a certified airplane, uh, it would have to, the, the, the software would all have to be FA certified. That's a very, very high bar. And it also um, makes it very difficult uh, to, um, uh, to, to evolve the software because every time you make the smallest change, it has to get recertified by the FAA before it can be deployed. So I wouldn't hold my breath. I think the, um, the, the, the more likely future is is that uh, someday this data will will be telemetered in real time while the airplane's in flight and that's not the the thing i was talking about that that we're we're pretty close to that would be telemetry at the end of each flight but eventually uh, i think we'll be doing what the airlines are doing which is 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 transmitting the data to the ground in real time and having it analyzed in real time um, and that could could have the potential of of providing real time alerts, but I think it's pretty unlikely that this stuff is going to wind up in a cockpit instrument, unless it's for experimental aircraft. Well, I, that's that's true, and actually that thought entered my mind just as you articulated it, Tim. <laughs> Great minds. Big, big market there, only growing too, Mike. Yeah, for sure. Larry wonders, can machine learning learn from machine learning? That is, are sensor failures detected with data gathering and analysis? Um, you know, that's one of the things that I believe that our anomaly detection project, which Mike outlined briefly in, the, in his presentation, might be able to look for um, the clustering among right clustering but but the reason we are doing the clustering is to try to identify anomalies um, in 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 and the really exciting thing about the the clustering anomaly detection is that we can filter flights as they're uploaded and and alert an analyst. Uh, for the flights that, that have anomalies detected, and then the analysts can look at it. So it's sort of a, a human machine interface there where, where you know, the, the anomaly detection screens and the human reviews and then contacts the client if, uh, if they see something. Um, sorry, I'm just, I, for, I think I, I, 
I think I got off track on that question, but the, the original question was about, sorry, say it again. Can machine learning learn from machine learning in an effort to maybe predict sensor failure? Right, okay, and, and so the question is, can you use machine learning to, to identify a, a failure? And I think the answer is yes. I'm not quite sure what it means to use machine learning to to teach machine learning, but but I I think that's the general idea. Okay, well let's see here. Um, Robert's question um, thinks: uh, Would you expect a change in exhaust valve failures if industry-wide changes to unleaded fuel would occur? So when we all get unleaded fuel, does that mean exhaust valve failures are going to decrease? I think is what he's asking. Um, well, let, let me qualify that. I think that that going to unleaded fuel will greatly reduce the incidence of of sticking valves, um, and and that's a kind of a valve failure. Um, I don't think that uh, going to unleaded fuel will change the incidence of burn valves. Um, FIVA is looking for burned valves. SIVA is looking for sticking valves. They're, they're two separate phenomenons, phenomena. And uh, I do think that, that going to unleaded fuel will dramatically reduce the incidence of, um, of sticking valves because it should dramatically reduce uh, deposit formation on valve stems. So is the type of fuel one uses part of the data that gets input into the system? I don't think we have access to that. No, no it, it's not. Yeah, we, uh, we don't have any way of knowing whether an aircraft is, for example, operating an unloaded uh, auto fuel or, or not. Mm -hmm. Well, let's wrap her up. We're getting close to the end here. Todd wonders, uh, after fuel flow, what is the next best, uh, oh, let me pull it together here. Okay, Todd asks, after fuel flow, what is the next best sensor to help detect cruise flight in addition to the base CHT and EGT sensors? Chris, I don't um, know if you wanna take that. Obviously, air data would be very, very helpful, but not, Every engine right. monitor has air data inputs. Air data meaning yeah things like altitude. And, and uh, right, altitude is is kind of the gold standard for our our identifying crews. And if if the aircraft doesn't have altitude, we actually use outside air temperature if that's available as kind of a surrogate for altitude. Um, and if that's not available, uh, the Probably RPM is the next most useful measure for identifying crews after EGT and uh, fuel flow. All right, well, let's wrap it up here. It looks like we had about 700 people logged in tonight, uh, roughly. So great presentation, um, amazing work that you're doing there at Savvy Aviation, Savvy Analysis, Mike. Chris, thank you so much. Uh, Mike, take a moment and share your closing thoughts with everybody. Okay. Um, would like to invite you to uh, to put yourself on our uh, email list to receive uh, our monthly newsletter and our weekly maintenance stories. Um, the newsletter includes the the, the Joe's Puzzler that that uh, Chris was talking about. Um, the maintenance stories uh, uh, every every week we we pick a particularly interesting thing that happened to one of our clients and we write it up and uh, typically there are lessons learned um, in each one. That's the, how we pick the stories. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, there are a couple of ways you can get on the list. Um, you can um, text the word savvy s a v v y to three three seven 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 on your phone. And uh, that will um, activate a text bot, which will ask you for your email address, and that will put you on the list. Or you can go to the SavvyAviation.com website, and there's a button up at the top of the screen 
uh, to uh, add yourself to the mailing list. Or if you stick around, hopefully to take uh, Tim's post webinar survey, there'll be a checkbox on the survey that you can check mm -hmm. in and get added to the list. But any of those ways, um, uh, I invite you to put yourself on the list. Um, my four books are all available at Amazon, uh, Aircraft Spruce in the EAA bookstore. Um, and uh, if you have, read any of the books which i hope you have uh it would be great if you would go to amazon and post a review and um the next three monthly webinars i, I always do a webinar on the first uh, wednesday of each month and the next three are, are listed here october webinar i'll be talking about a uh, an incident that happened to me not very long ago uh, where where my cessna 310 bl blew a tire on uh, on landing and wound up uh, shutting down a very busy airport in Southern California for a little over an hour. A uh, bunch of lessons learned from that that, that I will uh, talk to you about uh, in case something like that ever happens to you. Uh, this is the first time I've had a blowout in 55 years or so of flying, but it was a pretty interesting experience. Um, November webinar uh, entitled Hot Jugs, we'll be talking about um, uh, problems with with CHTs that are too high and uh, and what we can do uh, to rectify them and how we can diagnose what the cause of them is so that we can rectify them. And the December uh, webinar will talk about propeller overhauls, how often we should do them, do, should we pay any attention to propeller manufacturer TBOs or not, and if not, how do we decide when when to overhaul a propeller and so on. Uh, propellers are an interesting subject because Propellers are one of the two things that ANPs are not, not allowed to work on. Um, propellers and instruments are those two things. And so most ANPs don't know very much about propellers or instruments because they're outside of their um, the, the, what they are legally allowed to work on. So we'll be talking about propellers in December. And, um, and that's how, all I have, Tim. Well, very good. Excellent presentation. Amazing. Uh... Uh, information. Uh, thank you so much, Mike and Chris, for sharing it with us. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. See you next time. Night, everybody.